vision for the year 2020 is a long-term plan to deal with economic growth and reduce poverty. But this could be a mirage as the gap between the rich and the poor attains its highest level, especially in the three northern regions. Well, we are aware that Ghana achieved the 2015 MDG target of halving poverty. But we're also told that one person out of every four is living in poverty in Ghana and that's so 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 unacceptable why am I saying this I believe you know that poverty development and transformation are linked and therefore a wider inequality gap between the poor and the rich means a huge loss to the nation in terms of development so how do we get out of this critical situation then government comes in to say we are doing so well with the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty LEAP program. In fact, 230,000 people are currently benefiting. Then why are we still here? Well, government is looking forward to extending the LEAP number to 250,000 people. And we're also expecting the operation Get Off the Street, among other programs, to come in soon to deal with the problem. But then, the question again, how soon? Is soon. I'm sure you know today is International Day for Poverty Eradication. And on PM Express today, we are looking at the surest way of eliminating extreme poverty and how, I mean, how we can move this agenda forward. I will get deep into the matter with my capable guests, who I will introduce after this break. Welcome back. It's still PM Express with me, Aisha Ibrahim. My guest tonight, Dr. Kojo Apeakubi, is Chairman of Parliament's Poverty Alleviation Committee, and Maxwell Kuyem, who is a Social Protection Specialist at UNICEF. Gentlemen, good to have you in the studio. Thank you. Well, let Thank me you. start with uh, Maxwell. Maxwell, your findings reveal that the gap between the rich and the poor has widened. And in fact, you say that the inequality gap has uh, reached its highest level. I mean, in your research, uh, did your research also tell you what could be accounting for this widening gap? Thank you very much, Aisha. As you rightly said in your intro, um, Today, as we said, we have one in four Ghanaians who still live in poverty, in spite of the significant improvements that we have seen in our history from the 90s till today. But interestingly, even though we have achieved some progress in reducing poverty, as we see today, there is a very high difference between the poor and the rich. In fact, the analysis shows that the highest ever in the country. Now, inequality will usually result when you have differences between how the poor and the rich benefit from the growth that occurs in the country. So if the programs and the services that are available in the country result in a greater benefit accruing to the wealthiest, than the poorest category, then you would find out that inequality will exist or will widen. Okay. All right. Let me um, come to you, Doc. Doc, um, of course, if we talk about a widened gap uh, between the rich and the poor, that means that uh, it's a very <laughs> worrying situation. I am very worried. Many people out there are worried. Is government aware of this situation? Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, government is aware of the widening um, inequality gap among the population. Um, today, as we talk, the inequality since 2005 has widened, has increased by almost 7.7 percent, almost 8 percent, and that is really worrying because it accounts for inequality accounts for a major cause of uh, the. the, the um, rising poverty levels in the country. And what is more worrying is the fact that uh, the poor, the really poor, are those who are suffering from the 
growing inequality, and that worsens this whole situation. Government is aware, and that is why government has um, the current government and the past governments also thought it wise to put in place certain socio-economic measures to alleviate the poverty levels. In fact, um, the inequality didn't used to be like that. Um, it has risen over the past few years, since 2005. Um, we had a situation where they, there was, we, we even experienced a reverse, a reverse of the inequality trend. Unfortunately, um, over the last seven, eight years, um, the inequality um, trend has been on the, the, the increase. We need to do a lot if um, we, 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 we do not want to sit on the ticking time bomb. Because um, poverty can be even a security threat. Well, um, being at a higher level, if it makes it worse, if we say the gap has widened, that's one thing. But if we say it's, it's gone up to the highest level, then that should be uh, a cause for concern. You talked about a lot of uh, interventions. Uh, we know about LEAP. That's so, uh, it's a household name. All of us know what LEAP uh, has been doing over the years. But what other measures have you put in place to, to deal with this uh, situation? Well, there are several measures that have been put in place to deal with um, the rise in poverty levels in the country, and especially the widening gap. Even though these measures have not been really effective uh, of late in dealing with uh, the rise in levels of inequality. Um, we have even the, the, the free SHS is also another measure of uh, dealing with the, the, the poverty levels in the country as well as the rising trend in, in the inequality. Um, we have, apart from LEAP, apart from this Ghana School Feeding Program, almost all the socio-economic interventions that of late have been uh, put in place are some of the measures that could be used to reduce the rising trend in inequality. Maxwell. Um, poverty can come in so many ways and um, you can talk about fiscal cash if people don't have cash uh, they are poor and you can also talk about all the other things that come I mean apart from cash in your research what was really your focus you focused on monetary factors or non-monetary factors or both good as rightly observed um, poverty is a state of deprivation that deprivation can be in terms of a lack of cash. That deprivation can also be in terms of lack of access to services, lack of access to good health, lack of access to nutrition, etc. So in, in all terms, if you decide to look at poverty in, time, in terms of lack of access to services, you can see inequalities between the richest and the poorest. Um, for example, if we were to look at under five mortality, as an, an index, you will find out that under five mortality, there exists a wide variation between the level of under five mortality for the richest quintile compared to the poorest quintile. But the research that um, was analyzed, the analysis that was done recently focused on the um, Ghana Living Standards Survey 6, and that was mainly relying on consumption, which is income. So that analysis is what uh, pointed out to the high level of um, inequality that exists. Between Means a lot of people quintiles. don't have money in their pockets. Exactly. The level of consumption that you will observe, for example, if the richest 10% of the population consume up to a third of national income, mm -hmm. as compared to the um, poorest 10%, just consuming less than 2% of the income, it tells you the level of disparity. But as, as I've indicated, even in terms of all other forms of deprivation, whether it's in terms of health, in terms of education access, you can still observe this high level of inequality that exists between the two different quintiles. Mm. That's very interesting revelation there. And Doc, earlier you talked about the free senior high school, you talked about the um, 
uh, food, uh, what school feeding program. We, 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 if we want to go into all of those issues, um, I think we'll spend about three days here. But we'll, we'll try and do with some of the major programs you've introduced. But let's go on to Skype and speak with Dr. Kojo Sedega, who is an uh, economic specialist at UNDP. I mean, he's uh, actually specialized in non-monetary poverty. Doc, uh, you're welcome on PM Express. Uh, thank you very much. Doc, we're being, and, told, um, we're being told that the gap between the rich and the poor has reached its highest level. And here I know we're not only talking about just monetary, uh, but also non-monetary factors, as uh, Maxwell just explained. What are these non-monetary factors, and how bad is this whole gap between the rich and the poor for the country's development agenda? Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank, uh, good evening to listeners. Um, the, when we talk about not monetary poverty, we refer to certain basic necessities of life. Uh, it ranges from your housing structure, your health, education, as well as some uh, utilities like water, electricity, and as well as uh, your living standard or income that you earn. Uh, so what, what happens is that uh, we try to see how poor people are not necessarily relating it only to monetary uh, considerations. And then we, as well as to see that beyond the monetary considerations, what are the constraints that people have? You know, at times you might not have money, but you might have certain assets that will help you to uh, make a good living. But what exactly. we find out is that um, in Ghana, and more importantly in northern Ghana, uh, even the asset owning of the people are very uh, in a deplorable state. You go to a community where uh, there are houses, all right, and it is roofed. Maybe it could be touched or, or asbestos or corrugated iron sheet, but the floor is not cemented or anything and you realize that the house condition uh, opens up the person to more vulnerabilities uh, like external vulnerabilities like weather uh, when there is flood or even when there is a hot or wet season the person suffer from all those and you come back to look at the food that the person eat whether the calorie intake is adequate the protein intake is also adequate uh, you want to see in the community what water they drink whether they drink from open well or just from a dug uh, well or from a pond or from a, a pipe bone water. So all those are the issues that we look at when we are looking at non-monetary poverty. But we find out that by and large, the non-monetary poverty is larger than even the income poverty. Maxwell did say earlier, uh, my colleague Maxwell did say earlier that about a quarter of the people are poor. That is just for the monetary poverty. But when you get into the non-monetary poverty, more than a quarter of the people are poor. And you'll find most of these in the northern part of the country. Now, coming back to your second question, that what uh, monetary, I think your second question talks about the monetary poverty. How, how bad this gap can affect uh, the development agenda of the country? OK. What, what, what we can we find out is this, that Poverty, poverty contributes to the lowering of our GDP growth even. Uh, by the 2012-2013 uh, Living Standard Survey, which is the Living Standard Survey 6, when you look at it, poverty contributed to lowering of the GDP. And in the same way, in the same way, uh, inequality contributed to lowering of the GDP. Uh, so poverty, as, as, as it is, it is a fundamental challenge to development. Why I say it's a fundamental challenge to development is that when people are poor, they can't generate income. And, and as they cannot generate income, what happens is that you cannot multiply that income. We, we have what we call the multiply effect. 
in a system that when you have one CD, when you pass through the system through production, it might come back and become four CDs. So when people are poor, they can't actually afford the services. So, and Doc, especially them. which areas of development will be mostly affected by this poverty gap? The poverty gap most importantly affects the GDP. So if it affects the GDP, therefore it means that it affects every facet of, of development. You remember the GDP is the total aggregate of our output that we have. Okay. So if poverty affects the GDP growth, it therefore means that it affects the service sector, it will affect the uh, agriculture sector, it will affect the industrial sector as well. Now, the basic thing that you can pick from this is, this is that when people do not have money, they can't afford basic services. So if they cannot afford basic services, the basic services will not grow because there is no demand for them. You might, you might have them in abundance. You have schools, you have hospitals. When people do not have the money to be able to buy those services, they will not be in demand. So they become white elephant. It's the same way the, in the production, the service uh, industrial sector, you might produce. And so long as people do not have money to buy what you are producing, what it means is that you can't sell. It affects that. When people do not have good uh, health system, it also affects your production capacity as well. So what, what it, uh, it has a spiral effect that the people are poor, it goes to affect their purchasing power. It therefore also goes to affect the, 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 the supply side of the economy in general. So it, it affects every facet of, of development. Doc, I'll have you hold that for a second and come back to the studio. Um, it's very interesting how this gap, not just a gap, but affecting the whole development plan for the nation. One of the, in, uh, uh, one of the major interventions that government has introduced is the, uh, uh, the LEAP, the uh, Livelihood um, empowerment uh, against poverty and we know that uh, over the years there's been public outcry for the monthly stipends to be increased so we just saw some increase and and we're told that um now an amount of 48 cities will be paid to one member household 60 cities for two eligible members and 72 cities for four eligible beneficiaries for a month for a month, not a day, for a month, honorable. And people uh, say that this, and, and I think you agree that this is not enough. It is way, way below. It is not enough. Um, I do agree with you that uh, the amount is below um, what will make an individual uh, move above the, the poverty ladder. But then, that is what the government can aff afford. What is, that is what the economy they can currently afford. Um, you know that uh, it didn't used to be like that. We didn't have even the LEAP. Um, the LEAP was introduced somewhere in 2005 or so as a social safety net um, to cushion uh, the very poor and vulnerable. So um, it's a trial. Let us uh, just accept it and then move on and try to complement the, the, the LEAP with other social safety net measures. Well, if you say this is what the country can afford, uh, a lot of people can challenge you that government is channeling monies into other ventures that they feel are not really uh, important and that government could channel those monies. I'll give you an example. For instance, this directive by uh, the president that we're going to have a recycling, uh, a, a cylinder circulation plant, and people are questioning, we, we, we need about so much money to put these things together and it means that we are not also going to be using our old cylinders we're going to be producing new cylinders that will take a lot of money to do all of that if government has money to do all of this why should i believe you if you say that is what government can afford well i'm not sure whether um what you're saying is going to be done solely by the government um the private individual will have to contribute as well but uh, that is also a, a topic that we could discuss at length. Um, let us For concentrate. For another day. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, uh, do it on another day. Mm. But I believe that uh, um, the economy has a lot of things to do, um, to cater for. And, uh, you know, 
the per capita income of these countries is about uh, $1,340. Uh, you can convert it into CDs. And ask yourself, how much can that be given to an individual to satisfy the, uh, the basic needs of that individual? So um, I would say that presently, let us um, begin with that and then move on. As the economy begin, begins to pick up and uh, the, 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 it begin, uh, the, the growth, economic growth begins to accelerate, the income begins to rise, um, it be, will become possible for the government to increase um, the, 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 the amount of money that can be paid to LEAP um, recipients. How does it strike you that this gap is actually affecting all facets of development? Um, indeed, poverty is a problem. It affects economic growth. It affects uh, productivity, especially. And uh, everybody knows it. But what we need to do is to grow the economy. That is the only way that we can reduce poverty. We cannot share what is not available. Mm -hmm. And if the more that we are able to produce, the more the higher the economic growth becomes impossible for the government even to distribute. You see, the LEAP is a distributive mechanism. It's not a productive mechanism. It's just to cushion um, people who are deprived, people who, are, who cannot afford um, to earn income or whose income are below the poverty line. Um, so let us say that, uh, good, it is not sufficient, but Currently, this is what we, we, we plan moving along with, and in the course of time, probably um, conditions will allow us to widen the scope, even the scope of recipients, as well as uh, the amount of money that could be paid to the recipients. Maxwell, um, government says LEAP is doing very well. You and I know that LEAP is not doing very well. Okay, then probably I should talk for myself and, and people out there who I have spoken with who think LEAP is not doing well, even though we've had some increase. What's the reality on the ground? You've been on the ground. On the contrary, LEAP is one of the social interventions that has been rigorously evaluated. And the rigorous evaluations of LEAP point to significant impacts in several domains. They have received significant impacts in the areas of education, in the areas of health, and even in the areas of improving the productive activities of the LEAP households. It would, it, would, it would possibly amaze many to know that the LEAP benefits are not just to the households. The LEAP evaluation shows that there are spillover benefits to the communities in which these households are. Mm -hmm. To the extent that you have a multiplier, any one CD that you transfer to a LEAP household had a potential of creating an additional 2.5 CD in the community. So LEAP benefits are not limited to just the households. And the benefits of LEAP is not just for poverty reduction, but it also stimulates economic growth. And I would like to put on record that one of the um, bad news for inequality is that those people who are poor and cannot contribute to the development of the, of the economy are not contributing to the GDP. Okay. So if you want to achieve an increased economic development, one way of doing that is empowering those people who are currently not participating in the development process to be able to participate and benefit from this process. So I think the LEAP is one particular social intervention okay. that has demonstrated a lot of impact and which needs to be further expanded. Government has, um, over the last few um, years, rapidly expanded the program, and government is still committing to expand it further. You mentioned 213,000 households. Current government is planning to extend it further to about 350 households by early next year, and possibly to 500,000 households by the end of 2018. I think this is an indication of how successful the program has impacted households, poverty, and the community. And that must be the reason why 
um, government is considering using this particular instrument because it has demonstrated sufficient effectiveness. Well, interesting, very, very interesting revelations there. But issues of poverty are very passionate issues. And when we talk about it, we can get so passionate. Let's take a break on PM Express. When we come back, a lot more of uh, issues to uh, get responses to. Welcome back to PM Express and we are discussing poverty in Ghana. We are told poverty has reached its highest level and this year, um, today is uh, World Poverty Day and it's being celebrated under the theme um, International Day of Poverty Eradication, answering the call of October 17 to end poverty, a path toward peaceful and inclusive societies and we're asking how do we chat this part of inclusive society doc if you're still on skype um i want to find out from you you've enumerated uh, a number of issues uh, that will be affected by this gap let's look at how we can bridge this gap um first we can bridge this gap by providing some cushioning for the poor, that they may be able to uh, pick up their economic life. And so basically, so that's why you find government is doing some programs like the LEAP program and the school uniform program, free HHS, uh, SHS, and those social interventions that are very important. They help the poor to be cushioned before the, the poor can take off. Now, the other thing that we need to do, it's also to ensure that we build both social and economic infrastructure in the areas that are lagging behind. And I think it is in the right direction that previous governments, including this one, uh, the previous government when having development authorities in some areas to ensure that those areas that are lagging behind uh, provided the basic uh, social and economic infrastructure. Um, and I know that the current government is also trying to look at an issue where they will expand beyond what is happening in the northern savannah area, that is the SADA, and now provide uh, development authorities for the forest zone as well as the coastal zone. But how that will fashion out, I do not know yet, but it is a step in the right direction that we need to consider that. Uh, the reason why I think it is important is that there are pockets of poverty along the coast as well and as well as in the forest belt. So they must also be looked at and have that total development as we go along. Another thing that we need to do is we need to generate jobs. Jobs bring income to people. And what income does is that it transforms people from one stage of economic life to the other one. How do we create jobs? Uh, we can create jobs through many ways. Uh, we can have direct government intervention in job creation. And by that direct intervention, I will, I will say it should be for a short term, but not into the long term. Because in the long term, employment must be generated by the private sector. So uh, the other part that government should look at and be able to generate that long-term employment is to provide an enabling environment. Uh, which enabling environment that government needs to look at? Government needs to look at issues and factors that will promote the private sector to grow and expand. And also, as they grow and expand, the factor that will help them to reinvest in their businesses to expand and absorb more labor force. Um, there are so many factors that the government needs to look at or certain incentives. It could be in form of taxes or what they call monetary incentives. It could also be non-monetary incentives like locational are uh, some locational advantages that could be given to some private sector to operate in. Uh, so uh, in, the, in, in, in another way is also to ensure that the monetary policy of the government must also be sound 
and that also provide the backbone for further development. Uh, when I say the monetary policy, I'm referring to how we manage our money supply, how inflation is tackled, how the exchange rate is also uh, made stable, and all these contribute to development. Uh, it helps the private sector to plan for uh, into the long term because if they know and can predict how the exchange rate will be and how inflation will be, it helps them plan. All right, many so, thanks to you, Dr. Kojo Sedega is economic specialist with the UNDP. We're extremely grateful for your time on PM Express this evening. So you heard him clearly, and one of the issues he raised that strike me most is uh, the unemployment issue, because if people have got the work, uh, they have jobs, I'm, I'm not sure they will be in the poverty line. And of course, it's one of the uh, tag lines for the NPP government uh, before it came into power. We, we know the planting for food, uh, for jobs, it has been launched. We know about the one factory, one district, one factory. Uh, all of these have been launched, but we're looking at results. At what point or when should we really expect some positive results from all these interventions so that we can begin to talk about bridging the gap? Very soon. Very soon. Maybe. If you say soon, how soon is soon? Well, these programs are beginning to be rolled out. There are interventions that are beginning to be rolled out. And as we roll them out, you see that uh, the, the benefits will then trickle down. Um, it's not only these, uh, proje these programs that are going to be uh, generate jobs. We have short, uh, short uh, programs that are going to provide short-term jobs. The Y Youth Employment Authority, for instance, is ruling out several modules of uh, job creation. And then uh, in due course, it has started already with certain with the youth um, in um, security and uh, community pr protection it has started already, and it has um, recruited quite a lot of uh, youth um, that is going to provide jobs. And I do agree with Koju that uh, the potent way of reducing poverty is what creating opportunities, creating opportunities for people to earn revenue, to earn income. And we can only earn income, we can only create job opportunities if we are able to accelerate the economic growth of the, of the economy, the economic growth. If you do not, we cannot generate the necessary um, environment mm. for jobs to be created. And okay. we can only um, create the necessary environment if certain factors are, are put in place. Um, factors like the macroeconomic situation, um, is stabilized. Factors like um, even the monetary policy that he talked about, inflation, all these things are factors that probably we need to have a handle over them. Otherwise, in the past, we, we, we've not been able to do that. And that is why um, Ghana have been, um, economic growth has been back and forth. This current government would like to accelerate economic growth. It believes in the private sector, um, um, economy and that is the way to go to create jobs the government cannot create jobs itself no what a government can do is to provide an necessary enabling environment for the private sector to to to, to uh, grow and then create the necessary jobs for the, the team and youth of the of this country and indeed if you do not that, uh, do that um, very soon we shall be facing probably a, 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 a bomb and we all appreciate the fact that a rising levels of unemployment is a, a, a recipe for um, disaster and we do not want to face that sort of thing so um, the government has within 10 months for being in office put in place a, a lot of programs and these programs are beginning to um, re uh, the, 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 the required benefits, and I hope that the Ghanaians will have patience um, 10 months or even the government. <laughs>
Uh, I would say five months in the office is not all that much. <laughs> you have no idea how you can run out of patients when there's no money in your and pocket. But, but of but course. <laughs> but these, uh, some of these programs have started reaping the ben benefits for the people of Ghana. And I believe that very soon, very soon, as I said initially, uh, you would then see um, the full benefits of these programs. Uh, uh, you would agree that, of course, a strong monetary policy is also key to achieving all of this. And uh, Doc hit it right there, that we need a strong monetary policy. Um, you are saying that you've been in office for just 10 months. But, of course, if we look at the increasing rates of uh, the interest rates, the ordinary Ghanaian is afraid to go for a loan to even start a business because if you're paying this higher rate, it's amazing. And so... Honestly, do you think that your government is charting the path of a strong monetary uh, policy? Yes, this government means business, and it's doing exactly that. Um, you were talking about the money, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, interest rate rise. You know, it's rather coming down. We've seen, we're witnessing a reversal of the interest rates, we've seen a reversal of even the inflation, inflationary rate. All these are f um, f um, f macroeconomic indicators. What's the interest rate at the moment? The interest rate is around 25%. And you said we, we are rate. coming down? We're coming down. It used to be uh, around 36 Okay. Because the, the government has been reducing successively the p uh, monetary policy rate. Mm. And that has contributed towards a reduction in the, the, the lending rates of banks. The government is not only doing that, it is also putting, um, engaging the commercial banks to find a way uh, for them also to reciprocate the, 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 dec uh, the declining levels of uh, the monetary policy. You know, it's, um, if you are in a free market economy, you cannot use the logistic me measures kind of put pressures on commercial entities to behave the way that we want. You need to prepare the macroeconomic environment for them to respond. And uh, it, it is exactly that that the government is doing. Mm -hmm. And in the course of time, when these private entities begin to appreciate, to accept that, yes, this is not just a 90 wonder, but it's a long-term plan for them also to respond positively you see that the, uh, the, 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 the economy would then start growing. In any case, already the economy is growing. We've never experienced uh, such a, a, a massive growth over the last, um, let me say, um, five years. That uh, the economy in the last quarter grew by um, almost 6.6%. Um, it's quite <laughs> tremendous. Um, let's not also forget that the economy declined to the level of about 3.6%. Four percent last year, mm. when um, we uh, attained a growth rate of about fourteen point four percent, and to decline to about three point four percent, and for us to pick up the pieces to rise up to about six point six percent is a feat that uh, can be attributed only to the good performance of this current government. Okay, so the end justifies the means. We'll see whether it's indeed uh, some good steps you're taking there or not. But Max Maxwell, I know in May 2016, um, government and some stakeholders came together to agree that they will extend um, banking credit, uh, credit banking. Uh, they would boost agriculture and diversify income. And plus, they said they will extend social protection to all. Uh, poor, particularly programs like the LEAP. You've been monitoring some of these events. How has the progress been? Has it even started? What's the progress like? Good. As you rightly said, in May 2016, um, the National Development Planning Commission organized a national forum on inclusive development. And um, out of that forum, there was consensus that policy needed to focus on some areas. Some of the areas you've mentioned, like agriculture, social protection, um, expansion of credit, um, creating jobs that have already been mentioned, are some of the areas that um, consensus were arrived at, that government needs to fo uh, focus its policy on those areas. Now, since May 2016, um, there hasn't been a lot of 
follow-up actions to these uh, um, consensus areas. In the area of social protection, yes, there has been some action plans that have been developed um, towards um, expanding the sector, towards bringing on board many more people. But in the other areas, I think it's good if um, government and policy makers can take a look at those areas and try and see if there can be a conscious policy, a kind of an integrated policy that will um, ensure that uh, the benefits of growth that comes. You know, Doc has been referring to um, growth that may have been registered within the uh, first quarter. It's very good, but part of the problem that we have had in this country is because the growth has not been equally beneficial to all categories of Ghanaians. Exactly. That's why we have the increase in um, inequality. Yeah. So um, even though growth is very good and uh, it's, it's acknowledged, it is useful to have deliberate policy in these areas of consensus to make sure that this group that is recorded benefits the poor as much as the rich or even benefits them more, what we ref usually refer to as inclusive development. Yeah. So we're looking forward to um, government taking up some of the recommendations that came out of this um, um, uh, forum and pushing them further so that we can we can see a reversal of the situation in due course. Look, <laughs> this is just a direct <laughs> advice to you. But you, you intend to increase the um, leap uh, beneficiaries of the leap program is currently two hundred thirty thousand, and you intend to increase it to two hundred and fifty thousand. Already, you said you you don't have enough because if people are complaining that the money is not enough, don't you think of? Um, actually increasing the amount to ensure that the beneficiaries are satisfied rather than are you just interested in the numbers or you're interested in results? Um, both, let me say, that we are interested in both. But the main reason the, why the LIB was um, initiated was to empower, part of the reason was to empower the recipients, not only just to give them handouts, but to empower them, get them to um, undertake uh, meaningful um, at economic activities so that they can move out of that deprivation. And uh, um, currently, you know, this government um, inherited a, a weak economy with a huge deficit, a trend deficit, in, uh, in, two, in double digits. And to be able to bring these things down and to uh, so that uh, you could, uh, the government can create an enabling environment for economic growth to be achieved. You need to tread cautiously when dealing with expenditure. In the course of time, as, as things begin to normalize, the government will be able to uh, increase the levels as well as the numbers. Do not forget that uh, the LIB was actually introduced by the, 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 the uh, former uh, um, government of the MPP. And we, we, we have no, we, we, the MPP as a government, even though we are uh, a market friendly uh, party, we are very much conscious of our social responsibilities. And that is why we've introduced so many social safety nets, so many social interventions. And once again, the free <laughs> SHS is one of the potent social um, safety net or social intervention that will go a long way in reducing poverty levels because it's going to enhance the skills of the people. And what does the, the poor actually have? The poor has more than anything than his labor. The only thing that the poor has in abundance is the labor. Mm. But that labor is not skilled. So if you want to equip that person to be able to undertake a, 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 any meaningful revenue earning um, sort of thing, you need to upgrade the skills of that person. Okay, so and this 250,000 uh, you're talking about, we, we expect that extension by the end of this year. You, you just said that you don't have enough. Do you have what it takes? I'm not to saying do? that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not uh, the government uh, uh, who, 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 which is going to take that decision, no. Okay, the, your, the agenda minister it, said the agenda that by yeah. the end of the but year we should see that But it's part of the program of the government. Uh, to expand 
um, the scope of the recipients as well as uh, the level of um, monies that uh, go to the recipients. Um, that is also part of the program uh, to expand um, the LEAP program. Mm. And I hope that, uh, as the minister said, by the end of this year, all these measures will, will materialize. All right. Uh, Maxwell, uh, of course, there's indication that uh, we, are, we have some huge uh, problems to tackle when it comes to development and transformation with these numbers we are recording with poverty. And you rightly said that we need some deliberate policies to deal with these things. I mean, beyond the deliberate policies, how do we deal with this situation? Yeah, one intervention that has worked, that has been proved to work, is the LEAP program. It's worked in several dimensions. It's contributing to productive activities. So it makes sense to expand to this. At the current 218,000 households that are on the LEAP, the program is just covering one in eight poor households. Now, even if the program were to expand as the uh, ministry has planned to reach 350 households will still be covering much less than the number of poor. We have about a million poor households that require the services of the LEAP program in order to um, reduce the kind of inequality we have. So it's, it's, it's useful for government to prioritize the expansion of this program because it has demonstrated impact. Another issue that needs to be considered is the benefit level which you referred to. It is interesting when you look at the benefit levels of the LEAP today because of inflation over the period. The benefit levels are equivalent to the benefit levels at 2013, just because of inflation. Okay. So this shows that there will be the need to adjust the benefit levels in order to improve the impact of the program on these households. So both in terms of the benefit levels and the number of poor people who need to be covered, um, it's, it's useful to consider adjusting these two in order to take advantage of the um, enormous impacts that this program has already recorded on the poor. Well, Doc, um, finally, um, the, the Gender Minister also talks about other intervention programs, and one she talks about Operation Get Off the Street, and uh, she also talks about Operation End Early Child Marriage and all of that. She didn't give timelines, uh, and I know Parliament works uh, in hand with such people. I mean, briefly, tell us when we should expect some of these things to come on board. Our time is up, so just briefly um, explain that to you. Well, I cannot give you the, any timeline since um, I am part of the legislature and not part of the executive, even though I belong to, we belong to the same party. But I believe that it's part of the program of the ministry. And um, I, I'm not sure of the, 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 the timelines of the ministry, but I believe that uh, if it's part of the budget, it's been budgeted for this year, definitely, the programs are going to be rolled out this year. Um, even they've invited us for um, a social protection workshop, and I believe that uh, all these matters will be discussed um, over the weekend. All right. But let me make a correction. You always um, say that I'm the chairman of the um, the Poverty, Poverty Alleviation Re Committee uh, Reduction of Strategy Committee. No, I am the former chairman. I'm currently the chairman for. Um, gender, children, and social protection. All right, so you're even more than appropriate to <laughs> be here. Well, that's all time will allow us about the conversation of narrowing this huge gap of equal, um, poverty and uh, the rich, the rich and the poor will still go on in our homes, at our workplace, wherever we find ourselves, we need to continue this discussion until we get rid of this thing called poverty totally in our system. It's been interesting uh, spending some time with you. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. Many thanks to you gentlemen for coming on the show. We'll be doing all this all over again on Thursday. Have a great evening.